I want to do the following. Uh, Paul, in this section, sort of begins with a description of how the gospel has altered who we are, changed our identity. And he ends with making a similar description about how the God, how, how God through Jesus, through what Jesus has, has done in the gospel, that we're studying normally, for example, in the gospel of Mark, has altered or changed who we are. And in the middle, he speaks about how this affects uh, what we're about, what we're here to do, um, how we should live or for what we live. And so I'm going to, it's almost like it's the frame of a, of a painting, right? Or the two loaves of a sandwich. This is very typical in the way that uh, Jewish writers would write, especially at this time. So I'm going to take the frame first and then talk about the middle. Okay, so I'm going to, in other words, I'm, the way I'm going to preach is going to be a little bit out of order, but I'm explaining to you what I'm doing. Okay, I want to focus on identity, which is at the beginning and at the end, and then conclude with what does this mean for purpose for life. So that's what I'm doing, just so you can follow along. I want you to, to first look at the uh, first uh, verses, 16 and 17, where the emphasis that Paul makes is that we are new creation in Christ. Now, notice I didn't say you are a new creation or you are a new creature, okay, though that, that's fair enough and that's true and that's how a lot of our Bibles used to translate this text. But the Greek says you are new creation. Uh, and there's a reason for this that I want us to consider. So that's why I'm sort of purposely framing it this way. But we read there that Paul says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. That's a way of saying according to outward, human, visible, perceivable standards. Okay, that's what that means. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus in that way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, connected to Christ, trusting in Christ, united to Christ, he, he or she, is new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What Paul is saying is God had given him, Jesus had given him a mission to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's every people group that isn't Jewish, essentially. Okay? And as Paul went out with a group of people, with, with his teammates to do that, to share the good news about Jesus, okay, as he did this, he, was, he realized that he was not to look at people according to the outer standards. You know, here we are, we have a Roman Empire that categorizes people according to their ethnicity, their religion, uh, their, their, their gender, uh, men and women, uh, their status, slave, rich, poor, free, um, all these categories. And people had value depending on these categories. You know, if you were a man and you were free, you had a category. And if you were wealthy, you even had a, a higher status and higher category. But if you were a woman or a child or a slave, you had a lower category. I'm definitely not saying this was good. It's just that's the way it was. You had all these categorizations for people. Um, and Paul says, when we go out and deal with people, we do not deal with people that way anymore. We do not uh, 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 regard, that is, view people, interpret people, define people, and therefore treat people according to the flesh, according to the standards of the world around us. He said, you know, at one point we even saw Christ that way. You know, he's, he's thinking of himself when he was a Pharisee before. He said, I just thought this was a peasant from Nazareth who was up to no good. I viewed him according to the flesh, according to human standards. But I don't see Christ that way anymore, right? Jesus has become everything for, uh, for me. I know that he is the Messiah, the promised king who is going to come and save his people. And so much more than that, right? The son of God, God himself become car incarnate. And this changes everything. And so he's saying, I don't see Jesus that way anymore, and because I don't see Jesus that way anymore, we, this team that are going out to preach the gospel, we don't see anyone that way anymore, okay? We see people in a different way. We see people, in other words, according to their new identity. That's the point of verse 17. The old has passed away, okay? Behold, the new has come. And the immediate implication for us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives is, in light of the gospel, you are not your old identity. You are not your old identity. Whether that's something that people told you, or you told yourself, or you have been telling yourself, or people have been telling you, that is not who you are. That is regarding yourself according to the flesh. That's allowing others to regard you according to the flesh. And it often reinforces 
lies in our hearts and our minds by which Satan takes us out. Uh, by, by, by saying Satan takes us out, I don't mean losing your salvation. I just mean by rendering, rendering you ineffectual in the Christian life and in Christian ministry. I'll give you an example from my own life. Uh, on one side of my family, on my dad's side of the family, we descend from the, uh, the Basque people, right? These people in the north of Spain, south of France, have a really unique language and culture. Very proud people, right? Very rebellious people as well. Uh, and known for being very fiery, right? Very intense and passionate. And for years in our family, when someone got fiery, we would say, well, you know, that's just the Basque in us. You know, that's the, that's, that's the Lagos, or, you know, they're Basque, and that's, that's the way it goes. And, and many times, even in, uh, you know, a lot of times, even in my own life and marriage, if anything happened and I got a little fiery, well, you know, Basque. I've heard people say, well, we're Italian, we're Irish, or whatever. That was our version of this. Um, it's a sort of a, a fatalism, isn't it? It's just that's the way it is. You know us. Johnson, Smith's, Lagos, whatever. So one day, the Lord really showed me, Sam, that's a lie. You guys have tempers. <laughs> you guys are sinning, and you've told a lie that helps you rationalize your sin. Helps you justify it. Helps you even give it a romantic kind of Hinge. And it's actually a generational sin pattern passed on down from generation to generation to generation. That's just the way it is. And it's, it is a lie. It's one of these strange lies we tell ourselves we don't even know where it came from. It's just, it's there. And it, that might not be what it is for you, but at some point in your life you messed up and people started calling you a failure, or you started to call yourself a failure or a loser. Or, or, or you have a, a situation in your life, a condition, a, a thing that really afflicts you physically, mentally, emotionally, spirit. and it's just like, well, that's just the way it is, the lot in life. God's decreed it, I've even heard things say, as if we can peer into the eternal decrees of God. And we use our Calvinism to justify what we really shouldn't be justifying. And it's a lie... And I want to suggest something, I'm going to be maybe a little bit provocative. It's not merely a lie that helps us be stuck and ineffectual for the cause of Christ in our life. Um, it's a satanic strategy. These lies are energized by the demonic. Sam, show me that from the Bible. Okay, I'll show you that from the Bible. James 3. I'll write it down if you're not committed. So James 3, verses 5 and 6 and verses 14 and 15. It's speaking about the power of our speech by referencing the power of the tongue. But we can say things out loud, and we can say things in here. It's still saying things. Notice what he says. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Right? We had these, these fires in California this past year that were started sometimes by just a spark. Right? And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Then it goes on, but, you, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not, be, do not boast and be false with the truth. Or just bask. This is not wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly and spiritual, James said it, demonic. Now, this doesn't mean that everything in our heritage, heritage and in our past and in our family or in our life is worthless or there's nothing to be proud of or to rejoice in. That's not, that's not what I'm saying, okay? But in your life, in your past, in your personal past, in your family past, there are for sure things in your life pattern that have sort of molded your self-perception, and that's just who you are. And the gospel says, if you've trusted in Christ, that's not true. You are regarding yourself, 
according to the flesh, according to the perceptions of this world. What does Paul say in verse 17? If anyone is in Christ, in Christ is a it's kind of a technical phrase in the New Testament. It's very rich. It's very loaded. It means you have put your faith in Jesus, and therefore the Holy Spirit has plugged you into Jesus, and you're connected to Jesus. His life is your life. You have a relationship with Him, and you are connected to Him. And what He has done and does on your behalf, He imparts and shares and supplies and pours out on your life. So, again, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is, and the Greek says, basically puts it this way, are you in, you, you know, are you in Christ? We would, the best translation would be to put a colon, new creation. It's almost as if Paul says, anyone who's in Christ, ta-da, new creation. Not new creature, not new being, new creation. Why? Because the hope for the Jews is this world is so messed up. This is the Jews before Christ came. This world is so messed up that God has to come, put everything to the right, you know, deal with the bad guys, honor the good guys, you know, and basically restart the world, reboot it. We've got to switch this off and turn, take out some of the hardware, put in some new hardware, put in some new software, and reboot the whole thing, start all over again. And that thing is going to be called the new creation, the new world, everything, everything physical and spiritual, material and immaterial has to be started from scratch because we messed this up too much. That was the Jewish expectation. And what Paul is saying is that's true, but guess what? New creation has already begun. Wait, I still get sick, I still die, suffering still happening. Yeah, yeah, but if you are in Christ, new creation. Think about what happens with Jesus. He's here, he lives, this, he lives in this world, he obeys the law, he, he uh, uh, resists temptation, he teaches people, he cares for people, he heals people. He is rejected and despised and dies in a, a, as a result of a, of a sham trial on the cross. He is buried, but then what happens? Resurrection, and his body is indestructible because Jesus himself is new creation in his person. He is the seed of another world. Am I making sense? He is the, the, the first fruit of the full harvest in his person. That's what Jesus means. That's why he is a resurrected Jewish man, because he himself is representing the beginning of something new. And what Paul is saying is if you have put your faith in Jesus, that new creation life in Jesus, you begin to partake of and receive and have which means that you cannot define yourself based on who you have been up, up until that moment, and that can be up until five seconds ago. You define yourself, regard yourself, understand yourself in light of what Jesus has done for you on your behalf. And this is not something you have done. At the end of verse 18, he says, all of this is from God. God did this. This is why it's good news, because if it depended on you accomplishing this, you're toast, I'm toast, we're toast. None of us have this power, but God did this for us on our behalf. We are unable to do it for ourselves. And so what, what uh, God is saying is, uh, and, and what happened, for example, in my own life is I had to repent about a lie that I, I received, I accepted, and I perpetuated. And no, the old does not get to, to determine my present and future. No, absolutely not. God says you are a new person. That's the new birth, to be born again. New creation. God is going to remake the whole world, and he begins by remaking us. And therefore, we already foretaste, taste ahead of time, heaven. We are not in heaven yet. We are not in the new creation yet. We still deal with the, the muck, struggle, brokenness of the world outside of us and inside of us, but also inside of us, God has begun a new work of new creation in our life. And that is the Holy Spirit. He, Paul doesn't here go into the explicitness of the Holy Spirit, but we know from the rest of what Paul writes and from the New Testament that the Holy Spirit is heaven inside of us, as it were. Because the Holy Spirit is God. What makes heaven heaven is that God is there. And wherever God comes to inhabit and to live, he turns that into heaven. And God 
by His Spirit, has come into your life if you put your faith in Jesus to inaugurate the new creation in your own life. And so the other side of this is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's the end of this passage. Remember, I told you I was going to go and look at the frames. Um, Paul describes here in 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is a, can be a convoluted sentence, but follow with me if you can. I'm going to read it twice. For our sake He, that's God the Father, made Him, that's Jesus, God the Son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to say that again. For our sake, in other words, for our benefit, for our blessing, the Father made the Son to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in the Son we might become the righteousness of God. Um, one way I can think of describing this is, I uh, was watching recently, you guys have figured out by now that I'm a major nerd, so I was watching uh, Zack Snyder's four-hour Justice League movie, bit by bit, bit by bit, hour by hour, different days. But there's a scene where one of the heroes, he can plug into all the computer systems of the world and see all the videos and all the cameras and handle, and he can hack into all the security systems and all the banking systems, and he just has complete electronic power over us, basically. He can hack into anything and control, manipulate anything that's electronic and online. And so he sees a, a young single mom, two kids running out of money, just really struggling to make ends meet, and she gets kicked, evicted out of her apartment. She's with her kids. Oh no, what am I gonna do? I need to get the last bit of money out of my bank account. And she's gonna get money out of her bank account and she only has $11. And so this, this guy, um, he hacks into the system and basically takes a bunch of money and fills her bank account until she has $100,000. Unbeknownst to her, she has no idea. So she comes to get money out and she's got $100,000 in her bank account. And you know, great, and it's a little bit Robin Hood, you know, he takes from the wealthy to give to the poor kind of thing. Um, but he's, you know, and, and he's the hero of the, or one of the heroes of the movie, isn't that nice, you know, um, doing a little uh, street justice kind of thing. But he's, he's doing that with other people's money. The gospel is much better than that. It's you have a man, Jesus of Nazareth, with a huge treasury of merit. You know, you could be Uncle Scrooge jumping into the piles of money, right? And he empties his treasury completely to the last dime and transfers that into your bank account. Therefore, you get treated as someone who has billions of dollars of spiritual merit, of moral merit. And he gets to be treated as someone who is in the red with all the justice coming upon him. In other words, what... What Paul's describing here is he's describing the mechanism of the cross. What does this have to do with people getting redeemed? It has to do with the fact that there is an innocent one who is innocent on your behalf, not to make you feel worse, which is, I think, the way we often understand Jesus. Jesus has behaved well so that I can feel guilty because I don't measure up to him. That's not the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is Jesus is God become man and fills his life with the treasury of righteousness and morality so that he can pour it upon your life because you are unable to do it, because you're about to go into the red, as it were. And you get to experience all the joys of being seen by God as the one who has his accounts full, while Jesus experiences in his life what it looks like to carry nothing but debt, the debt of sin, right? The debt of transgression, of brokenness, of selfishness, of, of everything that's wrong in the world. He gets to experience the justice come upon him for that. It's what theologians call the great exchange, right? Jesus gets treated how we deserve, and we get treated how he deserves, and he does this for us. What's fascinating is, one of the ways that people talk about this is, you get imputed the righteousness of Christ, or God. So in other words, God accredits you with his righteousness, right? But what's interesting about the way that Paul phrases it is that he doesn't say you have the righteousness of God, he says, in him you become, you are the righteousness of God. In other words, it's identity language. You are righteous in the eyes of God. God views you as someone who stands in the right with him. 
So even though you've rebelled against him, resisted him, run away from him, have, wanted to do, have nothing to do with him, he comes, pursues you, and he views you as righteousness himself, so you cannot define yourself according to your history, your past, and your failures. And therefore, you are, your identity is, you are who God says you are. Not what you've been telling yourself you are or others have been telling you you are. In other words, you don't define you. God defines you. Your old life doesn't define you. Your friends don't define you. Your family doesn't define you. God defines you. And what does he do? Here we see he defines you as new creation. It's all new. The past is no longer who you are. This is who you are. And you are the righteousness of God. You are in right standing with me. You have nothing left to give me so that I will like you. I love you with all that I have. I have given up everything. I have emptied my treasure chest for you because I already love you. And there's nothing else that you have to add or do so that I will love you. This is how much I love you. And this has all been done for us. And you know what the amazing thing is? Because God views us with the righteousness of Jesus... God loves you. God the Father loves you the way He loves the Son. So how do you think God the Father loves God the Son? A little bit, kind of. Jesus says that's how He loves you. Sam, where's the Bible verse? Okay, I'll give you the Bible verse. I know you want the Bible verse. Gospel of John, chapter 17 Verse 23, Jesus is praying for the, the disciples, and he adds this phrase. He, he's praying for their unity, but as he's praying for the unity, he says that the world may know that you sent me. Listen, listen. If you've heard nothing else this whole time, just listen to this one phrase. And loved them, you the Father, loved them even as you loved me. The gospel is good news because what? What this ultimately culminates is in a relationship with God the Father in which his love for you is comparable for his love for his own son and how much you think that is. Yeah, but, you know, I did this and this. No, no, no. New creation. No, but you don't know what I've done. No, 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 no. Righteousness of God. Righteousness of God. I don't know what could be better news. So I have to ask you, have you trusted in Jesus? And do you want to live a life defined by who you've been so far? Or do you want to live a new life? Do you want to break out of the lies that you've been trapped under? The way Paul says is the way through this is be reconciled to God. In other words, if you say, God, I'm sorry. I need you. Forgive me. Change me, I give you my life, you have my heart, and God will give you his. Uh, and if you're here and you still struggle to believe this, you know, you trust in Jesus, but man, you know, it's just I keep messing up on the same things. Here are a couple examples. I gave you in your notes, you maybe have a sermon notes, just some texts. You can go over them later. I'm only going to read two or three of them for you. This is just from the Old Testament. I mean, we even have, in the story of the, of the Bible, we haven't even gone to Jesus yet, and this is already how God speaks to his people. Look at Hosea 11, uh, 1 to 3, for example. It says, God speaks to his people, and he says, When Israel, my people, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. It was I who taught Ephraim, my people, to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. You know, when that, I, I, had, I had the privilege of officiating a, a, a wedding just two and a half months ago. Let me tell you what the groom looks like when the bride is coming down that, that middle passageway of the church. I mean, I was with a guy, I've never seen him display much emotion in his life other than when he plays soccer. It's just weeping and weeping and weeping with joy. His bride is coming down toward him, down the down the hall, down the passageway. This is the joy indescribable. And Yahweh, the Lord of the Israelites, says, 
as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Do you believe that God rejoices over you like that? Zephaniah 3.17, another prophet. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult, rejoice, okay, over you with loud singing. Look at this description of God singing with joy over his people because they provoke in him such delight and love. The, yes, the Israelites, the Israelites who end up in exile because of their apostasy and their rebellion. Yes, them. And God speaks to them and says, this is what I feel about you. I am convinced that most of us do not go through our day-to-day lives believing that this is the way that God sees you. But rather we see ourselves as defined by who we are or by what people have told us we are, or by our failures, and on that basis, assume what God really thinks about me. Which, even if I think, yeah, no, I mean, I'm saved, and yeah, but God basically barely puts up with me. God is, an, is annoyingly accepting me. Here's a question, though. This is how God views us. Paul says, therefore, this is also how we regard everyone else. So when you look at your brother and sister in Christ, do you remember that your God exalts over them with loud singing? And do you treat them that way? And this leads to our purpose. Our purpose comes from our identity, which is we are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, we represent God in, the, in this world. And, and I have to be very clear. This doesn't mean that we're perfect. So, oh, we are ambassadors to Christ, so we are exactly like Jesus. Anyone who's been a Christian for 30 seconds know, knows that's ridiculous, right? We stumble and fall immediately as soon as we step out the door to try to represent him, right? So by representing him, I don't mean we go out and we are perfectly like Jesus. Aren't we wonderful? but rather our job is to point to the one who is wonderful, okay? We're not perfect, but our lives are meant to point to the one who is perfect. By a changed set of values, the way we view the world, the way we relate to people, and one of the major ones is by by us recognizing when we mess up instead of trying to rationalize and justify it. We should be the first to say, I messed up. Christians should be known not for how perfect and and untouchable they are, but rather it's people who are very quick to recognize, we messed up again, I'm really sorry. It's people who repent, who apologize. But this is the thing I love. I'll go back to John 17 here. Let me give you an example from the Bible of how amazing this is. John 17, so if you don't know what John 17 is, the, towards the end of the Gospel of John, G, it's the night before Jesus dies. It's the night that Jesus is betrayed. He's having his, his last supper with his disciples, right? He's eating with his disciples. And, he's, and, and Judas is left, so he's with the 11 that are left, okay? And he's praying for them. And in a couple hours, they're all going to scatter and ditch him. And his, his hour of greatest need, when he most needs help, they're all going to run, okay? One of them is going to deny him three times when he's confronted with, with whether he knew Jesus. This is going to happen in a couple hours from now, and Jesus knows this. And Jesus is praying, and he says this, and this is eternal life that they, these 11, that they know you, God, that they they actually know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Verse 4, 17, 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and it has to do with them. I want you to think about this. These guys, he's invested in them for about three years. He's poured into them. We've seen this in the Gospel of Mark. They've seen him work, teach, do miracles. He's sent them out. He's called them back. He's done the debriefing with them. He's led them to feed the 5,000. He's, he, they've been with him in the thick, of, thick and the thin, the deliverances, all that's happening. And he is sitting with them and he's, he's saying, he's praying for them and, and he's praying for them on behalf, of, on behalf of them to the Father. And he says, I, Father, I have accomplished all 
that you sent me to do. In other words, with, in regards to them. And these guys are about to scatter the four winds as soon as he gets into trouble. And one of them is going to deny him. And you go, did Jesus make a mistake when he prayed that? I mean, they, uh, they really let him down, right? And I think what is going on is they had everything they needed in seed form. You know, he, he had planted the seed for all that they were going to accomplish when you read later on in the book of Acts and in the epistles that had been deposited into them. Now, for the rest of their lives, they were going to have to grow in matching with their lives and their reality what God had already invested into them. Let me say that again. God had already, Jesus had already deposited in them all that they needed. He still had to send the Holy Spirit, which was the final match, right? The final light. But he, they had everything they, ne they needed. But now they were going to, over a long period of time, have to conform in their experience what God had worked and planted in their hearts. But here's the interesting thing about the way that Jesus does things. He doesn't wait 30 years until they've kind of figured it all out and then send them off to the mission. He sends them off in the mission and they're having to develop and grow as they go out and do these things. So, for example, when you read in the book of Acts, Peter and John, for example, are constantly being surprised by what God's doing, even though they should have known already you know, how God reaches the Samaritans and then how God impacts the Gentiles and how the Gent And at every step, they're having to kind of stop and think about it, even though Jesus, if you read the Gospels, had already prepared them for all this. And that's what God does in your life. He doesn't wait until you've got your act together. And when you've got your act together, okay, now I can do something with you. He throws you into the deep end. And we learn to swim as we dog paddle in the deep end. Because if you have the gospel and you have the Holy Spirit, you have what you need. It doesn't mean you don't grow. It doesn't mean you don't study. It doesn't mean you don't develop. It doesn't mean you don't don't mature. It's as God massages these truths into you, he is also continually sending you out to represent him. And he works through broken people like you and me. And that's, that's the message here. But the key to accomplishing the mission, we are representatives of the mission, the key to accomplishing the mission is when we understand who we are. Until our identity is not secure in Jesus, I am a new creation. My past, my sins, my brokenness does not define me. God defines me. This world doesn't define me. God defines me. The people around me don't define me. God defines me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It's there when we understand who we are through what Jesus has done for us that we gain and grow in our authority and power to carry out the mission that he's given us. The, the Christians who get sidelined, I've seen Christians who get sidelined their entire life. They became Christians and their entire life, they sat on the pew. They sat on the pew, not because they didn't have the gospel, not because they didn't have knowledge of the Bible. They sat there and received sermon after sermon and went to Sunday school after Sunday school and went to Bible study after Bible study. And all the information was collecting and, and being acquired and built up in their brain. And they have a library of theological knowledge. But there they are, pew, 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 home, no major change, no major change, no major change. It's because they're still functionally practiced, practically stuck in, I'm so worthless, I'm such a failure, I'm such a sinner, I'm so weak, I'm so ineloquent, I'm so, and so on and so on and so forth. We have a mission. We have a mission to join the apostles in this mission, this calling, which is to call out to people and tell them, be reconciled to God. But if we don't understand the beauty of what God has done for us, I don't think we have a very compelling message to tell them. I mean, we can tell them the theology of it, but people will see in our eyes whether this is a reality that we're living. Is this a reality that we're living? I want to end with the way that Paul ends. Notice how Paul ends this message. 
Working together with him, with God, with Jesus, then, we appeal to you, the Corinthians, who were Christians, not to receive the grace of God in vain. If Paul is appealing to them, do not receive this grace in vain, is it not because it is possible to receive it in vain? I think that there are entire chunks of church history where most of the church received it in, in, in vain. That's the message for today. But I, I really want you to think, have I received the grace of God in vain? Have I received the grace of God? Have I allowed these lies? Have I allow, allowed a false understanding of who I am and what my identity is to shape and determine who I am, how I view myself, and therefore to neutralize me in the calling, the beautiful calling that God has given us?